Welcome to another episode of The Artist Report. I'm Braden Flynn, your host, and this is a recording from the October gathering of Connecting Things SoCal. Connecting Things is a once a month speaker series where we hang out with tons of creators, makers, designers, artists, photographers, and business owners. We then have guest speakers who come in and share insights into what they do and how they do it. This month's speaker was Nick Sembrato, who's founder and CEO of renowned silkscreen and letterpress shop Mama Sauce. Nick talks about building his company from the ground up, growing the company to the success that it is now, and a handful of good applicable business tips for any entrepreneur. Thanks, Josh Ariza. We are both, uh, uh, don't let him fool you, he's not SoCal all the time. He's from Orlando, where we're from. That's where we know each other. Um, and uh, so that's where I'm coming from, sunny Florida, the other Orange County, actually. Um, the, the other one with the Mickey ears and everything else. Um, um, so I'm here to tell you a bit uh, about Mama Sauce. I'm the founder of Mama Sauce, um, and I'll just start actually tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am an Italian American. Uh, that'll give you a little bit of idea as to where the name came from, uh, and I'll tell you exactly the more of uh, the story about the name, and that's a little bit about uh, what we're getting to today. Um, a little bit more about me. Uh, I am definitely a serial entrepreneur. I started my first business at 13, running a bulletin board system, which is that that old thing, kind of pre-mass. Uh, critical mass internet where I go beep 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 and you're like logged into someone's computer if you did that you might have logged into my computer when I was in middle school uh, if you're lucky if I was lucky enough maybe you sent me a check to subscribe to that before you paid AOL or Prodigy or, or uh, uh, whoever you pay for broadband now I was one of those guys you send a check to uh, to go on to uh, someone's computer and uh, and leave a message for someone or play an ASCII based game uh, then I moved into what you call retail arbitrage selling things on eBay and had a toy store on GeoC cities and paid my way through undergrad um, doing that and then when I went to grad school uh, I started a record label which is kind of the path that brought me into printing and I ended up selling that record label uh, into the Universal Family and Motown Records uh, and that's kind of my general path um, aside from Mama Sauce and directing the brand and vision there uh, and, and strategy I'm also the VP of Fiction which is now actually an equity stake partner in Mama Sauce where we do branded content uh, a lot of times around printing and we leverage what we do at Mama Sauce and our audience to create content for companies like Adobe, which is part of the reason that we're here, and other great companies. So we're trying to spread uh, as wide as we can in order to continue to create opportunity uh, in our Orange County, which is honestly struggling to create as much opportunity as your Orange County is. A little bit more about myself. I absolutely believe in treadle power, not just on a press, but with my feet. I walk everywhere I go, and yes, you could do that in Florida uh, because I'm not actually in Orlando, but uh, I'm actually in Winter Park. I haven't had a car in the last six or seven years that started out because I was broke because of starting Mama Sauce and then became doable because this beautiful little village. That is a four color letterpress print of downtown Main Street called Park Avenue, which is a brick road uh, that we printed on our letterpress four color process. And that photo is beautiful and modern looking, but when you separate and scan it and print it on a 1921 press like I did, it comes out looking like it was printed in 1921. And in our town, we have amazing other brands. Rifle Paper Company actually should be at the top. Other companies like fiction I just told you about, Purple Rock Scissors Maker, Hog Eat Hog. I wouldn't be saying Joshua Reza if he didn't leave and come to the other Orange County in our Orange County uh, Exchange program. Uh, that's all we do. Spot color is instead of CMYK, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, K meaning key for black, uh, where you have millions of little dots, which as you saw exaggerated on that four color press print before. Um, instead of doing those little dots to make up every photo you see, we actually hand mix every single color to match the Pantone value uh, that you chose. And if you don't own a Pantone book as a designer, please go get one. Pantone's at this conference uh, that we're at now, and yesterday I, I had like a minute to walk the floor finally, and I saw the Pantone booth and it was like, I just geeked out, because as a spot color printer, Pantone is like just one of those brands you absolutely, uh, absolutely love. So we use spot color printing on just the most beautiful machinery uh, that I've ever seen, and really my entry into spot color printing became, uh, the, the, the impetus of it was seeing a machine for the first time, and that's gonna be part of the story tell you. Uh, so we just use really beautiful equipment uh, to print really beautiful prints uh, that are tactile, uh, spot color. They draw you in. There's just something about the quality uh, and the weight and the texture uh, that really is just super special and brings to life what we do in such a, an amazing, amazing way. Uh, and in our eight years, um, five days from now, wait, what's today's date? The seventh, uh, no, uh, eight days from now, we are gonna turn eight years old. Uh, and in eight years, uh, handmade printing spot color, which means everything separated and plated one at a time and done by hand. Uh, we've done 
over, geez, we're, we're over 12,000 jobs in eight years, which is just an astronomical amount of handmade work. So we really, really stress over what we do. And uh, we've done so a lot of work for a lot of amazing brands. Uh, so we're really fortunate to be able to uh, do what we do with amazing people all over the country. And um, I think part of that isn't, well, a big part of it isn't necessarily us. There's uh, great people that do great work in what we do. We are just kind of standing at the helm uh, you know, being one of the people representing this legacy of print, and that's really what I want to get in today. You guys have Czar Press here in town, which is amazing and does quality, awesome work. Uh, Michael and Joey are back there, and they're, they're buddies of mine, and I love them. We're all in this together, and we're just carrying the torch and the legacy of something that really has um, been given to us, and we're just at the helm of and trying to be stewards of. Um, and that's spot color printing. And I think that it matters, that printing matters, and it's something to consider in what you do. And so I want to talk about why print matters. Uh, well, first of all, you know, honestly, I think I'd submit to you it matters because, well, you guys are here to listen to a, basically a blue collar guy talk about what he does. There's this interest in this, in this beauty of this thing that we do. And I think it's uh, kind of almost inherently answers like, why does print still matter? Um, and because designers really embrace what we do, uh, our brand has just been built on designers, right? Like we don't offer alpha graphic design. And part of the tale I'm going to tell you today in getting our name and, and, and developing what we do, um, it's built on the story of designers and their influence. So we're going to be talking about why print matters and we're going to talk about, about why good design matters and why your voice uh, matters. And so our brand um, is built on designers. If you're a designer in here, uh, thank you from all of us for, uh, in our industry for letting us build our brands and what you do because that's honestly one of the most important parts uh, that designers embrace us and trust us with what they do. And I think that's sick, awesome, rad, and cool and everything else. And that's one of our clients, uh, 55 Highs. Uh, like I said, we don't design anything, so I borrow designs from all of our people and that's one of my favorite spot color designs and cards that we do. Um, so, you know, print matters, I think, because it passes what I call the touch test um, and you know we said before that what we do is tactile even if it's screen printing or foil or letterpress you can feel it right and that's part of the touch test that's maybe the most easy straightforward answer about you know why I would say print matters because it passes the touch test but let's dig deeper into it you know if I want to go deeper into what the touch, te te ugh, touch test means um, I would say uh, that um, the touch test has been built over thousands of years, right? Uh, you know, a, a brief history of printing and what we do. Letterpress printing, Gutenberg, you know, Renaissance, 550 years old. It's a long time to mature and create something that has just honestly reached its peak. And, and then you have screen printing, which they found evidence of screen printing happening in China 2,000 years ago. And that's something else we do that's had time to mature and reach its peak. You know, and uh, screen printing, I think, really peaked a little, uh, uh, a little earlier than, than, um, than maybe letterpress did. And screen printing hasn't changed too much. Well, maybe around the same time. In the 60s, you know, letterpress really peaked in the 1960s. You know, from, from, uh, from, from Gutenberg's time, you know, uh, 550 years ago in the Renaissance, um, you know, it was a book press that went straight down and that lasted as a form and function the way the press functioned until about the, uh, the mid 1800s, 1850s. And that's when they introduced a Gordon style press with a clamshell and a flywheel. And on that flywheel was a U axle that had a treadle attached to it and you pedaled it and it opened and closed. And that revolutionized, you know, after 300 years, finally something new came. And then they thought in the 1890s, uh, you know, companies like Heidelberg in Germany thought, well, that U bolt, if we take the treadle off and we put a rod onto it and put it into a pump, we can create vacuum pressure and actually start to do feeding with it and in the 1890s that was introduced and that pretty much was what lasted until offset came around in the 40s 50s and 60s and then plastics came around and offset started to kind of take away from letterpress's legacy and then letterpress started to use plastics and wearable parts of so this real critical period of time where and michael you probably know this as well as anybody if you buy a press too late in the 60s it's going to have plastic bull gears and parts wearable in the early 60s you have a really state-of-the-art peak letterpress. So that's where it peaked, like 1960, right? And then it got revitalized when people started going against the grain and not just doing a flat kiss print, but actually putting it in and creating that touch and texture, which is part of that touch test. But everything I told you in that narrative is part of that touch test, that we have thousands of years on one process, hundreds of years on the other, to create something that's been perfected that we just represent as stewards. And I would submit to you as designers in other mediums, whether it's data visualization uh, uh, or, or web, 
or UX, UI, mobile, whatever it is that you're doing, you are at the tip of the spear to create a legacy that's gonna pass a touch test in times to come. And because of uh, exponential uh, uh, evolution and because of technology, it's not gonna be over a thousand years. It might be in your lifetime that we might create something that has a touch test that is so profound when someone interacts with whatever it is you're doing in your process. So we're fortunate to be inheriting uh, thousands of years of history and, and just working with it. You guys are fortunate enough to be building what's going to be the touch test that people pass. And every day, you know, uh, you're making decisions that are going to matter. Uh, on the other side, the next generation will be like, you know, those guys built something that we're getting to represent, you know? And that's super, super, super cool. So you're building a legacy is definitely something that I would tell you uh, for the touch test for you to pass, and, and we're just lucky stewards of ours. So, what's in a name? Mama Sauce is a really interesting name um, to me. I love it, and like I said, I'm Italian-American, 100% bred through and through, and that's part of it, and that's a really easy answer if I want to give you the short answer, but I want to give you the long answer, uh, oh, not as long as I'd like it to be, um, but I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of history and tell you how we got to our name and some of the lessons we learned along the way as we try to tackle um, making handmade products to scale uh, and merging good business practices uh, with quality experiences and a quality product and finding our voice and our name and our flow along the way. So it starts in 2007 and that's Joey, uh, the first employee uh, and that is literally me looking over my shoulder in our very first office and having a picture. That's how close we are and as our story goes along you'll see the distance that comes between Joey and I almost aligns with our success as we um, move further and further apart. So I managed bands when I had a record label. Uh, one of the bands uh, was called Band Marino. They were on tour. They used this company online that serviced indie bands. Bands. Long story short, um, they needed posters. This company's website, I was trying to get posters. They were not doing it anymore. I called them and said, hey, we need to get posters for this tour. And they said, Nick, we're, we just, we're getting out of the game. I said, why are you getting out of the game? I said, well, we just, uh, long story short, they, what they told me is they couldn't figure out how to scale it and make the money they want. They were a digital laser print shop. So I said, I got 5,000 bucks. Um, you know, to my name, uh, uh, just a negotiating tactic. And I said, how about I give that to you for your website and your 2,000 clients, and we take that over and I can print posters for my record label, my bands. They said, all right, so I got my Mini Cooper. Um, this is shortly before I sold it. Uh, <laughs> and I drove to Panama City, uh, and I moved the entire contents of this company in the Mini Cooper to give you an idea of how big this company was when I got it. So I got a website. And I got um, a bunch of paper, and they had a laser printer that they leased uh, that they turned in. And then I came back, and we put it in the copy room of a casting agency in Orlando. And so every day, we go to this 144-foot uh, uh, square office, and um, I'd make my way through whatever crowd of people that looked exactly like each other, because they were uh, all auditioning for the same role. <laughs> and I'd find my way to the copy room. And, uh, and then there we'd uh, sit. Joey would process orders for indie bands, click a button with a tabletop cutter, cut it, put it in a box and ship it and I would sit there and work on managing bands and growing uh, my side of the record label with my partner and that's what we did. Uh, and then when we kind of outgrew it, Joey got a little further away from me and then I remodeled my garage and that's where we were. We moved and, and, and just made a much more massive space in 570 square feet and there's that laser printer and Joey a little more distance and we kept doing the same thing. And uh, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, we were doing this laser click thing. Someone told me an acquaintance of mine, his name is Austin Petito, he's a great designer. He was in a garage and he had a silk screen press uh, where he was doing t-shirts and gig posters and uh, he was gonna go on a walkabout. And I uh, was just gonna get, everything, get rid of everything and go uh, discover something new. And so I said, Austin, uh, I've got about 10,000 bucks in the bank. <laughs> uh, what do you say you sell me all that stuff and teach me about this screen print thing? Because I think any bands would love to have t-shirts and posters. And and he said, all right, let's do it. I'm leaving in two weeks. Let me teach you uh, what I know. And so we got everything. It wasn't going to fit in here. So we actually moved into the house next door. And, uh, and Austin gave us two weeks of his time. Uh, and we built a bunk bed in the master bedroom above the desk where Austin would sleep. I don't know why I invested in that for two weeks of his time. Uh, we made a shipping room in the second bedroom. Uh, we mixed inks in the kitchen. And the press went in the living room. The garage turned into uh, the dark room. And out back, 
next to the kitchen, uh, cornered in by the press room or the living room, was what uh, the break room was, which was outside in the humid heat uh, where we'd smoke cigars at night in two weeks while Joey Bordenga, Austin Petito, and Nick Sambrato, three Italian-American guys, spent two weeks, night and day, trying to learn a spot color handmade process. But on night one, Austin Petito, an amazing graphic designer, the guy who built our brand, uh, he said to us, you know, I just don't think this is gonna fly. That's his brand, Tight Slice, right? This is the house next door and, uh, and the, the, the building of the darkroom. Uh, is this even coming up? Ah, PCX Media was the company that I bought. Panama City Extreme, what a terrible brand. Austin came in <laughs> and as a graphic designer said, all right, I know we got two weeks and no time to spare, but night one in this bunk bed, here's what I'm gonna do, that is not gonna fly. Uh, let me just at least reinterpret your brand real quick for you in a couple hours and let's just start there. And so he exercised his voice and he started educating us about design while educating us about spot color. And there we were for two weeks, uh, night and day, not having time to really even go get food or do anything else. Like any good Italian American mom, my mom would show up every six months and spend the weekend cooking and filling my freezer with food. And so Joey Bordanga, Nick Sambrato, and Austin Petito uh, ate mom's Italian food night and day while we learn to do this process together and on the very last night in two weeks when Austin's getting ready to leave we sat in that break room and here's the view actually uh, where you're looking in that's Austin Petito registering something on the vacuum press on the t-shirt press at that time uh, we were sitting in this vantage point and it was Austin Petito Joey Bordenga and myself smoking cigars Austin's leaving the next day and he was telling me about what letterpress was he said if I ever come back that's what I want to do and it just was this beautiful fascinating thing he told me and I had no visual for it and at the time you know you didn't pull out your smartphone because my trio resolution wasn't everything it needed to be uh, to go and look up what a letterpress was so I only had these visuals he told me and it was just this romantic beautiful night uh, with three Italian American guys who had lived on Italian food learning about this process mixing inks and bowls in kitchens and about to say goodbye and it was just super um, romantic and uh, I ended the night saying Austin man if you ever come back I want to do that that thing that letterpress I want to do this thing where we mix inks I want to make something special I want to do something profound and awesome and I, I just really love this thing that you introduced us to real printing not clicking a button and there over his shoulder that's the view of the break room to the left there's this window like a picturesque window it looks into the kitchen where you'd set a pie but instead of set a pie was this cobalt blue bowl with chunky red ink from an ink mixing mistake that I made and I, there it's sad just looming like a mistake that I let haunt me for the week but in that moment it sat beautifully and I said, Austin, if you ever come back, we'll do this and we'll call it Mama Sauce. And that's really where the name happened. And uh, so Austin, uh, a few months later, we kept doing this thing. He called me and said, you know what? I do want to do this. And so we stopped everything we're doing and we said, let's do it. We shut down PCX Media and we opened up Mama Sauce. We went to uh, the, one of the main roads in Winter Park, painted it red, put meat in the windows, a deli case with t-shirts in it. And we started doing Mama Sauce and people started coming in and asking for things like sausages and sauces, which we didn't sell. And it was very, very distracting. Uh, <laughs> Joey grew a mustache. <laughs> and then another great designer friend used his voice and he said, you know what, man, that splash page that you have up is cool and all, but why don't you tell a story? And this guy's name is Danny Jones and his company's called You Are So Last Year or Yasley. And uh, he's gone on to San Francisco and is doing amazing things at Dropbox. He was a lead over at San Francisco or at uh, Facebook and um, just a great designer. He said, why don't you start telling a story? Put your blog up and just tell people what you're doing because this is really cool. And so people, designers came out of the woodwork saying, this is amazing what you're doing in our community, can we help? Here's advice, Danny delivered us this, uh, this uh, AI you know, a file that was just full of marks that we still haven't used all of them yet today. Like, <laughs> uh, like here are a million marks for your company and brands. And it was just like, thank you. you know? And because I know what that costs from a guy of his caliber. And it was such a gift, both the advice uh, and the design and elevating us and educating us, not just in print, but in design. And so designers using their voice was the beginning of us building our brand. And when I say the tip is the spear of what you're building, you're also the tip of the spear of really exercising your voice to build a brand for the clients that you represent, not just yourself. So I think this, there's something really amazing when you practice your craft uh, about the voice that you have and the advice that you give and standing by your word and saying, you know, this is what it should be. This is me as a professional telling you what identity is. And I think designers have a lot of input that can go into just about any kind of company. And at this point, we're just doing laser printing. We've introduced uh, t-shirts 
and we have introduced uh, spot color posters. And then I was on tour with one of the bands. We're in Atlanta, which is a real city. And Joey called me and he said, the tabletop cutter that we have broke for the last time. Um, what am I going to do? I said, well, I'm in Atlanta. There's got to be a shop closing down because print shops are closing down left and right. Let me check out Craigslist. And I'll hop on the Marta and go wherever it is. Marta is their local transportation. We loaded in the band, got on Craigslist. There's a shop that closes. And I, uh, uh, I go down and there's an 87 year old man retiring. And uh, I said, I'll have that 1950 paper cutter, which we just retired last month <laughs> and um, and we finally replaced it and then I said what is that and next to it was this beautiful machine with vacillating rods that was just whirling around and shooting paper in and out of it and it was this golden bronzy greenish hue and it was the most beautiful monstrosity contraption I'd ever seen and the guy said that's a letterpress and it all came back to me when Austin told me what that was and what it you know looked like and the romance of it and I said I'll have that too and so I went back to the band. I said, guys, I got to go see about a press. And I wish I was, I got to go see about a girl. But um, so I loaded it up in a Penske. You guys can handle the rest of this tour without me. I was just tour managing. And I, I, uh, I cruised on back uh, to Winter Park. And, um, and, and, and just last month, I was in Atlanta. And I drove by the original building uh, where we got the press. And it was a really sentimental moment. And there it is. And, uh, and on my way back, leaving that building, I got to Winter Park. I slid open the door. And uh, Joey looked open in the back. Austin looked over the side and Joey goes, what's that? Austin goes, that's a letter press. And uh, there it was, we unloaded it. And then word got around and somebody offered us our first job. He said, and I did research, what's this gonna cost? And he said, what, what's it gonna cost? I went and looked around and I saw what the industry would charge and I charged him that. I don't know what I was thinking, it was kind of stupid because I didn't know what I was doing, but at least I did that because it took so long, at least maybe I made a dollar an hour while I did that. And then word got around that that was happening and then Fiction, the company I told you were now part of, the owner of that said, I heard you have this letter press and there's that beautiful machine, I've got the black lung pop. <laughs> and, um, and he said, I want to film this first job that you're doing and I don't know why I said yes but I did and then he came and he filmed it and this video went online and our very first job we ever did uh, coincided with if we go back to the blog day when we posted that uh, 2009 this summer of whatever it was uh, this time coincided with Vimeo becoming this hot thing artisan movement DSLR cameras just happened everyone wanted to see what they were doing and all the stars aligned that this video went viral and from our first job the phones never stopped ringing because people saw this machine and inherently the story that brought they thought that guy that machine knows what they're doing we'll trust them we had no idea what we were doing <laughs> but the floodgates opened and we had to move so we moved into a warehouse that's 2,500 square feet under AC with another 2,500 square feet not under AC we couldn't afford the AC on the other half and that's really dang hot in a city that gets into the 90s with 100% humidity on the regular and there we stayed from 2010 until March of this past year uh, actually I, March of the year before is when I rented the building but we took us an entire year to get into our new space but this uh, is where m a lot of my teeth got cut because um, you know after that first job we had to move this is where I lived when when I didn't know how to scale a business you know I, I yeah I moved to Winter Park to get a master's in communication I knew how to tell stories I knew my uh, my degree was actually in internet technology uh, and, and, and communication it was about going viral before that was a word. So I knew how to do that, and we were great at doing that. I didn't know how to grow a business. So instead of going out and seeking capital and doing a business plan and all these things, I, I, I just bootstrapped it, put it on my shoulders. I had two years of, of 1099s that would absolutely make you weep. I, I had lived on credit cards. I lived on a couch in that shop. I lived on Joey's couch because he was the guy that was getting paid. And uh, I, I just took it all on and I did it the wrong way. You know? And you know, I would say when you're trying to grow something, uh, an opportunity has to be met with an extraordinary response, but you do have a choice. You know, and if I could go back now, I have sold equity in my company and have a partner. And, and you know, and all this time, I feel like I've gotten the value of an MBA in business. And now, especially with the, the, the board and everything we have, that's cool. But if I could go back and do it earlier, I would have. And if you have the opportunity to have this extraordinary response, you don't always have to take it on yourself and putting the world on your shoulders. Uh, yeah, it can, you know, it, it can give you the scars and stripes and stories. But man, it's not fun to bleed and sweat and cry and live in poverty for what you're doing there are choices out there so there's a lot of different extraordinary responses that you can do and sometimes the response can be a really smart decision right so at this point we're pretty wide I've got letterpress 
I've got silkscreen t-shirts, I've got silkscreen posters, and we have digital printing. Digital printing is a commodity. We came out of the indie world where people wanted to pay nothing. We had high end, and it really made a brand confusion when people were like, this 25 cent poster doesn't look anything like what you guys do on the other side. I want my money back. And you're like, no, they are two different things. You can't manage. You can't fight two fronts of value at one time. If you're gonna be high end, you gotta be high end. If you're gonna be commodities, you gotta be commodities. And if you're gonna build an experience around everything you do, you need the revenue to support that. So we made a couple critical decisions. T-shirts out, we didn't wanna do them anymore too much. Uh, it just wasn't what we wanted. We fell in love with paper, right? Um, and then the most important decision that we made uh, was getting rid of the digital printing. So we took this laser printer and, and we did away with it. And I had just actually signed a five-year release and in December of this year we finally sent this printer back we literally had this printer for about two months we said we're not doing it anymore we closeted it and paid the lease out because I'd rather have incurred that sunken cost than had to go through trying to manage the brand expectations and everything else that came around with trying to do commodities and high-end at the exact same time so I would say from my perspective being hyper focused on what makes you great is just a valuable thing and for us when we really took off when I was able to get off the couch, when I was able to start doing things and, and start paying off debts, it happened when we started to focus on what made us great. And what made us great actually is where our passions lie. And that's what we pursued. And we did away with everything else that just didn't matter. And I told you about the dream space. And in Orlando, there is not much warehouse space. Can I get an amen, Joshua? Amen. amen. So <laughs> we found this other warehouse space. And I'm glad. I actually had a little bit of um, buyer's remorse when I committed to it because I was like, oh my gosh, and, we, and I knew it was going to take a year, but I, I had to have that building because there's not anything like this in Orlando. We were the only other industrial district right at that time. And as soon as we signed a lease on this, I was kind of having that buyer's remorse. A month later, we actually got a notice saying, guess what? You have to get out because we sold this property and it's going to be developed. And buyer's remorse was gone. And so we took a year and we got into our mid-century warehouse and we were in our dream space, 5,000 AC, complete, uh, 5,000 square feet, completely under AC. And uh, we have a dream team. We're creeping up on 20 people. Joey still has a mustache and uh, things are really uh, where we want them to be in our production facility finally. And um, you know from that whole story you know if I could pull a couple uh, you know um, bullet points and I apologize that I'm flying here. I just know that we start a little late and I want to get you guys to work, work if you have to go. Um, you know, everybody's watching, so I think, you know, whether you like it or not, if you're online, you are a media company, tell your story well, um, deliver on brands well, you have to hustle, you have to use the finest ingredients, and, you know, a reason to choose someone like uh, Czar Press or us, uh, every single choice that you make is part of your story, right? So choose your vendors wisely, tell your stories wisely, your vendor problems are not your client's problems, so make sure that you always represent your brand well and tell your story because you are a media company, and from that story, if I could take, you know, one thing I didn't cover there is that this all happened because we started to tell our story. We embraced brand and we just happened to be uh, the steward of something that was a sexy story to begin with. that had thousands of years to mature. Uh, I would also say that every step is the most important step, whether um, it's a hard learning lesson uh, uh, or uh, in what we do, there's a lot of different steps. If I could fly you through the process, if you don't understand what it takes to make a three color print uh, per se, how many colors is in your Spangler series? Three and five, yeah. So a five color, let's go there. Black French paper, right? It requires opaque ink, so we have to go screen print. You have a, uh, just, I'll get out of the paper process for a second, and I'll just talk about the print. Every one of those five colors, that design has to be broken apart, thought about, re-put back together, separated in a way that it'll work, print order thought about, inks mixed, inks ordered, papered ordered, screens made, films made, every screen made. That job has to be done by hand to an addition of 250. Is that what it was? I don't remember. Anyway, 100, 200, whatever it is, and then cleaned up, set up, run, cleaned up, redone, over and over times five, you know, it's just a lot of work. So, you know, that's our process, but that's also the process of building a business. If someone along the way, whether it's an intern at the back end doing quality control or someone doing the separations at the very front end, uh, skips a step or misses a step, the entire process you know, is just effed. And that's just not in screen print, but that's just the world, man. That's just life, that's business. So every decision that you make right now in your brand uh, echoes on in eternity, right? And so you need to be making decisions right now for a month down the road, a year down the road, five years down the road, because no matter how big your shop, we're not a big company, you know, we're 20 people is a small shop, you know, or it's a small company, but it's still 
once you get out of mom and pop or a freelancer, as soon as you have uh, you know, uh, W-2s, and as soon as you have the government and landlords, uh, everything starts to move slower because your world gets more complicated. So the step now and the step later are intimately linked no matter what the timeline. So that's why I say every step is the most important step. And for us, a lot of our story was undoing bad decisions that I made along the way. Uh, and if I can fly through and give you one last piece of advice, we love, um, we came out DIY, right? And so we, our minimums, are, we don't have them. I mean, it's a lot smarter for me to be like, well, you know, minimum of X, you know, but we want to keep it open and accessible. And the only way for me to get out of that is if designers start to take it upon themselves to do the, you know, that work that keeps them, uh, you know, intimately connected to what they do. In the dream world, you know, a lot of people would think like, oh, no, shop like, Nick and Mike's, you know, they may not want people printing at home. Oh, absolutely we do, you know? Because in a dream world, you guys are feeding your design by being linked to the process, not just by watching what we do online, but maybe doing it yourself. Not by showing up to a press check, but maybe by building a DIY rig at home where you can R&D or do small batch production if you want to go to Etsy or uh, dream to go to anthropology like Rifle. But be connected because it feeds your design, it educates you, it inspires you yourself, it connects you to that. And then it puts us in a position where we don't have to, um, as production facilities still try to keep it open to you because that's our great desire is that these processes will stay open to you. So if you take it upon yourself to buy a mini letterpress or put together a screen print press, our world gets better. So it's really not about territory. Uh, that's why Mike is here and I'm here and we're buddies and we can hug, right? It's more about just making more of great things. And that's really it. And so when it comes time for you to find that great thing to go to a scale, you can call Mike, you can call me, right? But in the meantime, you know, find ways to connect to these processes. I would say that's a beautiful thing. If there's a maker space you can join here, do that. You know? Certainly subscribe, you know, subscribe to the, the stories that we tell. But the more hands-on you could be, uh, the better off I think the world would be uh, for you and your designs and us as production facilities. That's my story in just like a very fast lightning round. <laughs> um, and you guys, we'd love it if you follow along with us. We'd love it uh, if you want to see what the kind of things we do in, in person. If you don't know Czar Press, Mike is the guy with the Czar Press shirt back there and the S on his hat. I'm sure he'd love to show you around his shop. We're getting ready to launch a new website with videos about what we do. You'd love to look inside our space. You could do it there. If you're ever coming to the other Orange County uh, for a conference or Disney or anything else, give us a call and we'd love to show you around. Uh, but that's my story. That's how Mama Sauce got its name. And uh, I thank you for your time. I hope that it was informative and that you enjoyed it. Yeah.